In today's episode of the Unveiled podcast, Bryce Harris and I discuss, can they ever really change? Those people in our lives that frustrate you or you feel like aren't working with you towards a problem or to just having a normal, peaceful life, can they ever really change? Is it possible to get somebody to change? Is there a difference between intimate partners, family members? Do you really get to ask people to change? And what does it really mean when you're asking them to change for you? Is that okay? Are you allowed? We discuss whether it really is true that you need to be giving the thing to you before you get it from other people. Think love or respect. And we bust a few myths, as we usually do on the Unveiled podcast, discussing whether we truly believe that you absolutely need to have it all squared away inside you before you get what you really need from other people. All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Another beautiful day for the Unveil podcast. Uh, my name is Brace Harris. My name is Victoria Fenton. And we are Unveil. Excellent. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, so today we wanted to discuss something that we feel like pretty much every single one of us uh work in through quote unquote deal with uh look to improve in our lives and it's um expecting change in others um what that means what we're wanting from others why we may be wanting that from others um and going into the different types of relationships uh i think that uh that we're moving into and through and, and how our expectations can shift depending on those type of relationships and how the rules uh, of the relationships can kind of uh, create the criteria of how we move through that, that change aspect. Um, But first Let's do uh, a little check-in. Victoria, how are you today? I'm okay. I um, It's been a it's strange times at the moment, isn't it, Bryce? It feels very weird mm. being with you, kind of like being a million miles away and having to look at the future and really assess what should go where, given all of the juggles and the likelihood that I'm going to be in the UK until May, beginning of May. Well, second week in May. So... Mm-hmm it's a lot and it's a lot of kind of processing and you know what can we do in the meantime and and you know I'm having that typical life admin stuff of the my computers having a existential crisis itself (laughs) (laughs) it feels like having a heart attack whenever I do more than one thing at once is a legitimate response to my needs and I'm feeling like if I wanted anything to change right now it would be that so yay except you know I want one of them fancy new Macs with all the fancy new chips and fancy 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 stuff and they are not making them until well they're making them but it won't be delivered till i'm coming back to america so i'm waiting yes so yes I'm yes using my my dad's computer to try and edit our course videos which take up a lot of memory and a lot of gigs and a lot of the things and so yeah but we look very pretty i like it yes you got your hair did oh no i look i look prettier today than i did in- <laughs> My goodness, like we are, there is going to be a massive state shift around module five, six, where people are like, what happened to Victoria? (laughs) Because I'm going to, anyway, I don't care. (laughs) How are you, Grace? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, Ready to get you back in the States. Um, There's a lot of, a lot of things that we want to get done, but unfortunately being on different continents uh, makes it a little bit more difficult so we get to be innovative in how we use our time and and all that so victoria gets to be very tired because she's always working at seven o'clock at night when she speaks to it (laughs) yes the the time difference uh does is a is a bit of a gut punch uh in more ways in more ways than one um but that uh is is we're getting there yeah we're getting there everything is coming along i i I think as smoothly as it can uh i mean mean, which kind of nothing (laughs) 
sorry. Like if you're watching, my my computer did its its heart attack thing. So I apologize. I'll try and polish that up on the audio, but the YouTube will have Brace go mid moment. Yeah. Um, but no, I was just going to say to be super clear for people, just to announce this, our workshop is definitely going to be the 11th and 12th of June. And we are definitely going to have our online transformational healing retreat launched in June, whether it's slightly before or slightly after the, the workshop. <laughs> Depends on how quickly we can record the videos, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. So, yeah. And as far as changing that, um, maybe not being able to change dates and times and flights and things in the, the outside physical world, but as far as how we approach it, like our, our inside journey, we, we do have control over that, which kind of, I guess, brings us into our topic for t- today. Victoria, would you like to lay it out? You're very much better at that aspect of what we do than myself. Fire away. Mm-hmm. So today we really want to talk about can they ever really change? So we've all been there. We've looked at people and we've gone, oh, wouldn't it be great if they just did X or Y or Z or possibly all three or like, why do they do things that way? And we've just looked at someone, usually family members or significant others or colleagues, friends, and really wanted change from them. And it's really interesting because the typical thing that you get when you come into our world, and we were discussing this before we started recording, is, oh, something something stupid, like be the change you want to see. <laughs> Essentially meaning, yes. like, if you want X, you have to be X yourself, and then you will get X. So think of um, and you gave some great examples. Like if you want love, you have to love yourself. If you I mean, self first, right. right? It's like if you if you want trust in your life, then you have to trust yourself first. Um, it's like I have to become this in order to have somebody else do this for me, or you know, get this need fulfilled. And it's like, yeah, and this okay. Is- This would be a really short podcast if all we were going to say is if you want that thing, be that thing, do that thing. It would be like a 10 minute. I mean, we'd finish now, basically. (laughs) And and we were discussing, like, we understand why there's that broad stroke of, you know, if you, for example, if you want love, you have to love yourself or, or, or things like that. But there's so many nuances that we started discussing and getting into that are essential to even truly understanding what that very broad stroke even means yeah Yeah, I think we got to the the sense where people are trying to give love to people all the time people are trying to trust people all the time people are trying to give Mm -hmm. to people all the time we're a very giving humanity the the challenge is in the receiving so and huge distinction yeah major yeah Yeah. So I think what we kind of said is, yeah. And this is, I mean, this is going to be like a sentence or two in this podcast, because it's not the main thrust of what we're going to talk about. But I think what it's really, it's, it's really paramount to make clear to people is that if we're wanting something from someone else, the prerequisite isn't that we are that thing ourselves, or we give that thing to ourselves, like love, for example, the prerequisite is that we can receive that thing from the other. And sure, having the ability to give it to ourselves is one ingredient in that ability to receive, but it's not the only one. And it's not even, I don't think a prerequisite. I just think, you know, having that belief that the possibility that you will be loved is there. If that's there, you will see and feel the love from the other people. It's, it's not about, I need to love myself completely and wholly and love everything about me, every facet about me in order to receive love. I just don't think it works. Then, yeah. So many people would never receive love then. Right. It, like if that if that was the rule. Yeah. And it's we always see this. Other people love us more than we're capable of loving ourselves because they don't see our flaws. They don't live inside our bodies or our heads. So I actually think it's completely false to say in order to receive love, you have to love yourself first, because that it's almost like, yes, there is the whole fill your own cup and then everything else is like just the overflow or the icing on the top. And it's like, yes, and and, you know, we're human beings who receive suffering who like feel suffering and pain and we do question ourselves we live in a comparison society and sometimes I will speak to for myself alone in this but sometimes 
the bits that I can't love about myself, other people love for me. And I'm like, oh, that's lovable. And I think it's it takes other people to demonstrate what is lovable because we can happily run around in our own brains thinking that this bit's unlovable and that bit's unlovable and maybe that bit's not quite lovable. But then if somebody comes and shows you that it's lovable, the only thing that you need to do is receive it. And people have definitely shown me love for things about myself that I don't feel. So it literally can't be true that in order to receive love, you have to feel it for yourself. I agree. And receiving is... <laughs> especially for myself in certain aspects. It's one of the hardest things to do. Uh, and receiving the things that we have been told or we understand about ourselves to be quote unquote bad or toxic or not. The prickly parts. It's like, like having people love on your prickly parts and then learning to love on those prickly parts yourself takes a lot of rejiggering of how you see yourself, how you think. <laughs> You're chuckling. <laughs> Tell me. I'm just chuckling about prickly parts being loved on. It's all. <laughs> I was having a very childish sense of humor at that moment in time. I apologize, dear listeners. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so. It really isn't true. So if, you, if the change that you're wanting to see in the other is them to love you a bit more, the problem in this scenario isn't always just you and you need to love yourself a bit more. So just don't always be so keen to make it a, a self job of self. Because um, we're going to get onto the point that it is a self job, but it's not a self job of you need to do that thing more for yourself and then it will come from the outside world. I think that's super important to sort of grasp and put in there as a, a caveat because the more we think about it and the more I think about teaching it and the more I think about like the stuff that we're creating, the more I see the sort of cesspool of the coaching world, unfortunately, there are so many memes and received wisdoms and things which really denigrate the truth of the human experience. It isn't okay to say you have to love yourself before anyone will love you because that's, a, it can feel like a real impossibility. I'm a thousand percent sure there are people not being loved because they're still working on themselves to get themselves to a place of self-love that then they'll start dating because they think that they won't receive love if they don't fully love themselves. It's just, it's not, it's not okay to like dismiss the human condition. I, Sorry, I shall step off my soapbox now. No, no, no. It's good. Mm. It's good. And I think it's important for us to kind of, Re reconfigure how we approach this because hmm. I think it's a, it's delicate hmm. and a lot of the times we take it as this again well you know it's just uh this is the way it is it's like hmm. is it it's I mean no we can we can get specific and into the minutia of of what that really means hmm. and truly understand it and I think you have to, to really, really understand it, to understand what you need. I mean, just again, going back to the example of loving, you know, receiving love. It's like, there's a million things that actually go into what that truly is. It's not just this thing you do, because if it was that easy, everyone would just do it. And yet we don't. And then we have a billion, million self-love books and podcasts and you know, gurus workshops. yeah workshops <laughs> yeah <laughs> workshops but it's 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 really interesting to to really get into it and to to dig into the depths of it because mm. i think and i can speak for you as well on this that's the only way to truly fully understand it is to dig in like really dig in and get get kind of messy with it and understand how we how we see it because I, I i have a feeling that each individual has their own unique experience of what that actually means for them and you get to kind of dig in and understand where you agree with yourself or not agree with yourself mm -hmm. and why mm. yeah and it's um so let's speaking of getting messy let's get into the weeds of getting yeah. people to change and I think the key one is you are allowed to want people to change. 
again correcting yes. some of those like negative well so-called positive uh memes but you know th- you are allowed to feel like you deserve better if you do like if there is a bit like, and we are going to break this down into um intimate relationships i.e significant others and then family because the landscape as brace said right at the beginning of this podcast is different but we're going to start with our intimate relationships because this is often the place where people want change small or big um and you know families again huge change desired but that's an t- entirely separate topic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so when you're with intimate relationships i mean it's um you know everyone feels like a compromise is 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 a negative um but the whole thing about being in a chosen relationship with someone i think is about accepting that you get to meld your world beings and your attitudes and your approaches and if you're doing that you can't say oh no but in order to meld i'm going to keep all of mine and i'm not going to change anything and so i mean that's just my opinion I, am i totally wrong in my opinion brace well, I I think that's the ideal. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting as you say it, because I think most people go into it with, yeah, that's the way that it is. And then all of a sudden, everyone's stuff starts to come up and then it's like, oh, compromising. What does that mean? And then your nervous system and your body has like all these interesting reactions to what compromise might mean and so on and so forth. And so you kind of get to go in and, and look at that, but ideally that's what a relationship is. And I love that you said that because you said people's stuff starts to come up and this is everything when it comes to change. Like last week's podcast was all about procrastination. Essentially we were saying, how do you change this habit? And the reason that you weren't changing the habit is because stuff was coming up and we're saying the same thing here. Like if, if you're seeking change from another and they're resisting it or there's a problem, it's because their stuff is coming up. And that is, you know, will they ever really change? Well, it depends one, how you go about asking them to, two, how ingrained the thing is that you're asking to change three, whether they really love you enough to, and let's just be super brutal. Like there is a level of love required to do your work for another. And it's huge. You have to really love the person and the potential of the relationship more than you love your safety blanket of trauma patterns. Yeah. <laughs> so it has to be quite significant. Otherwise you're not going to just volunteer to. Show yeah. Up. Well, and. And I think we can even substitute, especially like loving the person versus loving your, your safety blanket. It's which force is more powerful and sometimes our away value, and when I say that, it's the, the thing that's more important, it is feeling safe or avoiding those triggers more powerful than keeping the relationship. And it's like, and, and that's something we can't answer for you. You know, and it's so unique to each individual. Um, to weaponize that, so you don't get to weaponize that. Oh, you would if you loved me enough. Mm. Like I think this is weird. Oh thing yeah. Oh, yeah. If you love me enough, you would. You oh yeah. man. And it's like, <laughs> and the thing for that, it, it, I am, yeah, yeah. Just to put this out there, I am single, so maybe I know nothing, and I'm a terrible person to be talking about this. But it just strikes me as like, if they don't love you enough to change walk away is that me being just super reductionist and simplistic it's like okay and and there's a line to that so there's a line of oh it's icky and icky but can you help me and be here with me and can we change together that sounds like doable but if somebody is just a flat out no and they're your chosen partner Uh why are they your chosen partner like it does yes (laughs) you like I mean I know we said you don't have to love yourself in order to get love but love yourself more than staying in a relationship where your partner doesn't respect you enough to consider your needs exactly and and I think that's what it comes down to the needs it's like these are my needs and if you're approaching it efficiently Mm -hmm. with understanding and authenticity and and, you know and integrity Mm. it's not and again it's not my way or the highway. It's like, you have to give me this or like there is room for compromise. Mm. And I feel like the compromise gives space for someone to be like, 
I don't feel comfortable fully committing to that, but I'm willing to take these steps Mm -hmm. to improve whatever situation is not meeting your needs. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a loving thing to accept that as well. It's like, I'm asking for it, say I'm asking for a need from Victoria and it's highly triggering for her to, to meet that need, but her being able to step out of her own trigger and be like, okay, I hear you. I understand that this is a need for you. I'm willing to do this, 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 and this. I don't necessarily feel comfortable with the rest of it as of yet, but I understand that that's something that I need to look at separate from you on my, on my own. Uh, I think that that is extremely healthy and being able to understand, but if it's an absolute no, especially when you're coming with a lot of sincerity and integrity and what you're asking for, and someone is an absolute no, I think you're right. It's, it's an opportunity for you to be like, okay, I love this person for all the things that we've been through. And I need more. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think the thing to point out is if you are in that space of acceptance of love, as in putting up with settling, it's possibly because you had to just settle when you were a child. You just had to like be good with what you got from a love perspective. And a lot of the mm-hmm. times we find ourselves in relationships with, which mimic the energetic map of childhood love. Um, and that goes for attachment styles, although they're way more complex than people make them out to be. But it also goes with this, like how much love do you think you deserve? That's often patterned into you since you were a child. And you end up with this kind of perspective of, oh, well, it's, it, it, it's good enough. It's good enough. It's good enough. And, you know, we're not here. Which to keeps people, you there. Yeah. yeah it does. And we're not here to tell people that you're good enough is not as good as you deserve because that's a personal choice that everyone gets to make. But I personally am a huge believer. In fact, I've just been editing our video where you end it by saying, we all get to trust in love. And it's like, we do. We get to trust in this kind of connection with people. Um, and it feels like if you're settling and you're like, will they ever really change, but I'm not going to do anything even if they don't, it kind of is a, a an opportunity for you to do your own trauma work on why you're um, why you don't believe you're worthy of more. And I think that what we're talking about here, and we've alluded to it, but let's just call it out super straight. It's like when you're wanting change from another, you're saying that some part of who they are or what they are is affecting you. And it's affecting you in such a way that it is having negative consequences. And at that point, you approach the, can we change? Can you change? Can you do this for me? But the interesting Mm -hmm. thing is that that characteristic will require some undoing for that other person. And they have to be really willing to look at the things which ingrained that characteristic, which is always going to be deep work. It's always going to be inner work. I mean, we're not, and to be super clear, we're not talking about the surface level idiotic stuff here. Like, you know, can you shut the door in the, like, instead of leaving it open, you know, or, or can you like put the toilet seat down? That's, this is not this level of stuff. We're talking about, big change. We're talking about, will you ever change? And I think about a couple of my clients who I've had where their partners were addicts. And the question, will Mm. they ever change is not, will they ever change and put the toilet seat down? It's literally the question, the existential question that is being asked there is, will they decide to love me more than they love their habit, their addiction? And that's huge. And ultimately, they're the only one who can do that. You can only be the influence on this side, supporting every element of what they're putting themselves through and be compassionate, but without sacrificing your own reality. And it's so common in that kind of relationship dynamic where the whole unit gets the, the whole oxygen sucked out of it into the addiction. It's not just the addict's problem. It's the entire family unit that has the problem. And it's these situations are where that battle of asserting your needs and having your feelings on the table has to make quite a lot of space for an addiction that Everyone wants to change because the addict usually doesn't want to be addicted, but the change has such a deep and profound challenge and trigger that 
it becomes super complex in terms of actually getting to that point of change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the broad stroke of that, you know, loving yourself to get love Mm -hmm. thing comes in. And again, we'll just use the, the addict thing, like staying in that relationship there has to be i feel a very strong sense from the sober partner of who they are what they are the love that they have for themselves and the behavior of the addicted party doesn't determine the values the value system set up within the self does that does that make sense yeah and it's super tricky to do you know because most people are codependent in a little way or a lot of a way you know most people judge themselves on the way they're making their partners feel said with massive inverted commas around it like that is not you don't make your partner feel anything i mean you can have impact but it's always a um it's a dynamic it's not a cause and effect so there's a dynamic nature to the way things impact and yeah I mean as the sober party in this example um, it's it's so easy to lose your sense of self it's so easy to not feel like you're valuable because the one that you love has chosen something else over you and that's literally what it looks and feels like and it's challenging and it is very much a, a case for the sober individual of recognizing that this is a behavior not a personality trait because that's the only way you can get through it. It's it's a chosen right. behavior and chosen not consciously necessarily, but it is a it is a chosen behavior that has a chemical complexity to it as well. So within all of this, it's very much there's a there's a need to work as a team in order to support that change. Because to be the 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 let's keep using the same example, but put this into any context, to be the the one that's inviting the change, the sober individual in this example, you have to be in a state of inviting the change. You can't be lecturing the change into, into place. You can't be, you know, whinging every five minutes and expect the other person to actually think, oh, I should level up. It's actually, you have to invite and inspire that transformation. I love it. Beautiful. Well, How about, and, and I feel that we've, we've covered kind of the relationship, uh, you know, change aspect fairly well. Um, and correct me if there's other caveats that you'd like to add on, but there's also the relationships with family that are very different. Yeah. I mean, so different because family are not your chosen partner. Like you don't choose your family. And so everything that we've been speaking about is about that emotional commitment to another to inspire the change, to be part of the change, to support the transformation as a unit, and then to decide to maybe leave if the change doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But everything to do with family, they are there. (laughs) You know, you're kind of stuck with them. And in a sense, this is where the personal journey becomes more important than the duo journey or the the dynamic of the couple. This is where we can start to take way more personal responsibility because you don't get to expect your family to change. You don't get to put the, I mean, you can excommunicate family members if they don't do the thing that you want them to do, Um, but you don't get to just demand change or it's a non-starter. You, you know, you have to go around at Christmas and make conversation. And the the reality (laughs) And we both have been there. (laughs) And the reality of all of this is that, you know, the the family wounding can be way deeper as well. Like because the family, the the family members that you may want to change probably have been hurting you with this behavior since you were zero, particularly the parents, particularly Mm. the siblings. Like we call them mother wounds and father wounds and sister wounds and brother wounds and all that jazz. And it's like we have names for them because the way you were you know, the dynamics that you were around when you were brought up have a massive impact on how you show up in your daily life. So whereas your partner is just triggering you with a behavior that was instigated and conditioned into them by somebody else, your family are triggering you 
And they literally have conditioned you into your trauma patterns because of their conditioning that you may now want them to change. So it's super costly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Would you say, would you say it, it would, it's harder when it comes to family? Oh, a thousand percent harder. Like I, okay. I often will do several months long. Like I would do three, six, nine month coaching programs. And in my six month coaching programs, we can spend the entire time building up to what we call a clearing conversation with a significant family member. We mm -hmm. can spend the whole container trying to get people there because it's really important, particularly as adults, that when we approach that clearing conversation, that attempt to get them to change or attempt to get them to see how they've impacted, the individual that's desiring the change oftentimes will drag in a million and one other confusing, confounding variables based on their adult life, which have nothing to do with the individual. So they then end up hurling you've been responsible for all of my life's crap at their family member, which is not a good way to have a clearing conversation. So right. <laughs> we spend 90% of the time before that conversation, separating people out, separating out siblings from parents, separating out where the wounding was, because it's not very useful to feel like it's all one person. Cause we can, we're very like, we want, we like reductionism in our brain. It's a human brain thing. We like things to be simplified. So we tend to actually just blame one person as opposed to recognizing that it's the whole complexity of it. So it, it tends to be that, you know, the father gets the, the brunt of the blame for things that the mother failed to do and things that the brothers did as well. And it like, it all gets mashed into let's blame that person. And then you're kind of seeking change and you seek the change from the one person because you think they're the one person that's done anything to you. And it's like, even if they did change, you still wouldn't necessarily have resolved everything because they weren't the only one. So Yes, family is way harder on every end of the, like through every part of the trajectory, both getting to the point of like thinking, oh, maybe we should ask them to change. Having the conversation, super challenging. The post conversation, like regression to the mean, because they always do. It's like, even if you have the healthiest clearing conversation and you kind of have this like release awakening moment, the next conversation, they the, the other person usually has reverted to the mean. It's like, it's, 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 frustrating and because family you don't tend to see every day you don't tend to see them all the time unlike partners where you're kind of consistently showing in your face every day that kind of behavior change and you're always working in it together and there's that recommitting kind of recommitting yeah right. with family members it's like once in a blue moon or every time you call them every sunday and it's like oh so we had that one conversation and that's gone then so sorry i've mm. just leapt ahead to like the million and one complicated things with family sorting but it is so much harder and it's so much harder because you don't have any right to demand anything of a family member even a parent who's wronged you and parented you it completely inappropriately like we said it within the, the um, partners conversation what you're asking them to change is usually a trauma pattern that's been laid down it's a behavior that's eminent from a pattern of restriction in their nervous system somewhere so you know what you're essentially asking people to do is look at their trauma stuff and that's mm -hmm. Not a request you get to make of certain people. Well, hmm. well, something that's occurring to me right now is like with a partner, you're asking them to look at trauma with a family member is where it gets extremely difficult. And this is just a question for mm -hmm. us to, to ponder. Is it we're asking, because usually the person that we want change of and from is somebody who has basically implemented the wounding that is coming up for it's almost asking them to take responsibility for what they have done to you and a lot of people have very strong reasons why they were that they were or an excuse like oh we just did the best that we could which is true and it doesn't change the fact that it hurt you and helped to form coping strategies that don't necessarily serve you any longer. Um, so it's, a there's, I feel like it's, there's a lot more weight when it comes to family than to a relationship because the consequences, if it goes awry, will also be massively impactful in one, in one way or another. Cause you only have one mom, one dad, you know, a maybe one brother or sister or you know whatever and 
if it goes all right, which, and that's why a lot of people are okay with just letting sleeping dogs lie. Well, and so. Okay. Yeah, please. This is where it gets super interesting because, you know, we've kind of said like with a partner, you get to expect change because you're deciding to commit to one another with family. Mm -hmm. You don't get to expect change, but okay. So how do you deal with it then? Because clearly there's something that's triggering if you want someone to change. Um, sure. And I think you touched on it. I don't know whether you quite made the point that you were, were making, but it's like what you're doing is you're trying to correct a behavior when you're trying to ask a parent particularly to change. You're actually saying you did this, th- you do this thing and you've done this thing and this has done this to me. So you almost try, you uh, said it, get them to accept responsibility, yeah. which is the worst way to go about this sort of thing, because right you're literally on a witch hunt and it it doesn't take away the truth of it at all. You absolutely are a, you know, you're saying that that behavior was responsible for this thing. And yet the thing is a consequence in you and you get to work on that for your lifetime. That's your opportunity. That's your responsibility Does it Mm. also include a witch hunt of the person that perpetrated the crime? No, doesn't ever have to. So then the dynamic becomes how, and this is why I say to all of my clients, I can only coach you. Like I can't, I cannot coach your parents. I cannot coach your siblings unless they want to come to me, but I cannot coach anyone but you. And therefore, Mm -hmm. even though it might not feel fair in quotes there is always that sense that if you're at my door doing work with me you're the one that gets to change something not you get to ask others to change you get to change and what you get Mm. to change is the nature of the impact that their behavior had on you and that doesn't mean the behavior changes like I, I love the word and our mentor Christine Hasley used this and it's stuck with me ever since consistent Family will always be consistent. And it's Mm -hmm. about how do we, within knowing that, do our work typically independently of those clearing conversations. It's not about saying you did this, you did this, you did this. It's about going, they did this, they did this, and totally going into that and totally blaming them in your own little world, totally having your own little victim pity party. Really Yes, yes, yes. Away from from them, far away from them, hopefully. Far away from them. Doing all of your release writing, doing all of your emotional release techniques, doing all of yes. your like screaming at the sun, moon, whatever your chosen avatar, doing doing all of that and totally knowing that their behavior is the reason. Their behavior is totally the reason. And then after you've moved through that little window of stuff, focus on the behavior, not the reason. So you're then focusing on the consequence of the behavior not the behavior itself. So you're, you, sorry, you're co- f- focusing on your behavior. That's the consequence of their behavior and their treatment, not their treatment in and of itself. And in that right. way, you don't need them to change once you do this work properly, because you don't yeah. need them to be anything but who they are, because they can't hurt you anymore because you've processed the bullshit that came at the end of the original treatment. Yes. Yes. They're going to continue to do them but the way that you have process and now interpret how they are empowers you to, you you don't necessarily need them to take responsibility. You don't, you don't, that's not a need for you anymore. You don't need them to heal you. You heal you. Mm. That's great. And I love that you said that because it's like, why do you want, like we haven't touched on this because we usually do the whole kind of let's pull this back to like a very basic thing. And this can be very annoying, but why do you want people to change in the first place is a real question. We haven't asked it, but particularly with family members, it's like, why do you want them to change? You want them to change because, and if you think about it, the only reason you really want people to change is because you want them to know how much they hurt you. You don't want them to change for you anymore because if you're in the realm of knowing this and being aware enough to be listening to this podcast, if you want change from another person, you basically want them to admit that they did wrong. And that is very victimhood, very out there kind of stuff. Whereas once you've done the work and doing the work, you know, it's not as complicated as people make it out to be. It is literally owning it. It's taking the full audit of the situation and really knowing the impact that certain behaviors and certain treatment from family members had on you and the patterns it's created in you but you're working on the patterns you work on the behavior you work on the somatic retention of the memories you work on you because working on everyone else is a waste of your time it's like if you 
even if like just theoretically you could have a massive clearing conversation with a parental figure and they see the error of their ways they completely change and they're different the next day and they stay different you still haven't resolved the somatic imprint in you of the behavior that they enacted when you were a child so you've achieved literally nothing do the work first do the work on you first well, and, and I think going back to, again, the broad stroke, that's what it's actually saying. You have to do the work in you first before anything else can happen. Yeah. So if you want, you know, love, you've got to learn to love yourself. It's like that is a very, 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 very simple way of saying you have to do the work on you before anything else. Well, and I think it also happens. I think it also means that you, um, when you're sitting in a place of want, wanting someone to change, wanting someone to love you, it's kind of a, you want, if you want it because you want it to fill you up and you want it because you want it to change you, that is where that broad brush strokes of that sentiment doesn't work. Like if you're looking for love because you don't have it yourself and you need it, to replace something or to fill up a hole, then yeah, Mm -hmm. you absolutely, I mean, and this is the thing, it's like, once you've done the work, you don't often need the thing that you think you needed before you did the work. Begin with. Yeah. (laughs) That's so exciting. That's an exciting part of this work. It's like, Uh, oh, I didn't even know I needed that, (laughs) that thing. It's like, oh, right. So refreshing. And it's why we're not like performance coaches, because we don't believe that anybody wants what they say they want. (laughs) Because- It basically comes from like a ton of conditioning, unless you've done significant amounts of work. So it basically comes from a place of wounding, unless you've done the thing that means that you get to the point where the thing that you're actually wanting is accurate. And so for me, I've been in this world so flipping long. I have a real problem with desire lists and what do you want lists? And to me a little bit it's my own thing as well it's not okay but I feel like I don't know what I want because I'm really happy with what I get because every step along the way is accurate and correct or whatever I want to use to say it which means that what comes is the right thing rather than me sitting there and having a crazy vision board and thinking I need to get xyz but what I think about this whole like will others change thing is if you recognize that you want somebody to change and then you go "Mm, because it's triggering something in me what is it triggering in me and you go and do the you work you change the trigger therefore do you still want or even need them to change to change right typically not because it's not triggering anymore Uh and so that's the big thing particularly in the relationships and we're back up to the relationships it's like is the behavior actually triggering you So are you wanting them to change? And actually it's a you problem. And this is where it all comes back to personal responsibility because sometimes, particularly within relationships, it's a them problem and sometimes it's a you problem. And it's only on you to know which. And it's like, that is what radical responsibility means. It's like, you are responsible to honor yourself in every moment. And if honoring yourself means accepting that it's you being triggered and it's not somebody else doing something wrong, that's just universally the right thing to, to accept. Boom. Love it. Okay. So once you change, is everybody else going to change? Wouldn't it be lovely? It's another one of them things. Right. That- Day. it's like you want it on a hallmark card you know be the change you want to see change and then people will change around you and isn't it wonderful and do you know what I don't I don't know Grace do you so from what I've experienced mm. and I'm going to use myself as an example when I started doing this work and started shifting things within myself um, there were some things that I wanted change from others. And it was more a take responsibility thing. And the more I got more okay and more comfortable in my own skin and not needing that from them to validate some feeling in me or to fill this hole within me. And I didn't realize any of that stuff until I started doing the work, which is that thing that we were talking about. It's like, Oh, it was actually, this is what I needed. Not what I thought that I needed. Um, I found that it shifted how I was in people's presence, especially people that 
I initially wanted change or responsibility taking from. And the more comfortable and calm my ner- my nervous system, my being was within them, I all of their same stuff would come out. It didn't affect me as much. And in that, they almost felt more comfortable and safe themselves. And I, and I don't know if I'm making myself quite clear. It's like my calm and their presence actually made them calm. It was like my good space that I was in actually influenced how they were feeling because traditionally they would have a behavior. I would get triggered and amp up and they would feel that and then amp up even more and then amp up, you know, and it would just go back and forth and amp, amp, amp. And they amp up. I stay calm. They actually come down and feel comfortable and safe. And I actually have had the experience of, of clients that have kind of come into this more (laughs) Zen way of, of being around, especially when it comes to family. Um, you know, I had one client mom stuff a lot, but they got really chill and calm and understanding of who they were. And they didn't necessarily need something from their mother that they didn't necessarily need to begin with. Like they thought that they needed it, but it was only to fill that hole or, you know, appease that wound uh, to dress that wound. And the more that they became centered in themselves and were in the presence of their mother, their mother actually started to change because the mother picked up on, it wasn't like, Hey mom, I've changed because of you and stuff. It was, they just started showing up different and by showing up, differently in this positive way, they almost rubbed off on their mother and their mother started to be more calm and chill and gentle. It was almost like, you know, you've heard horse whispers, you know, there's a wild stallion and the horse whisperer is just there and calm and present. And all of a sudden, after a while, the horse starts to trust, trust the relationship, trust the the being, the other creature that's in their presence, because there is a a very calm safeness that is there. So it's not necessarily the person making active changing moments. It's the work that we do on ourselves influences the relationship between yourself and other person. Yeah. I know I just went about them in a million different directions, but does that, it's yeah. like, they don't necessarily change, but their relationship right. with you starts to, <laughs> you yeah, <could>. thanks. <laughs> cool. Cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no. And it's, um, it, you know, you can't, if the situation was a sort of a trigger tennis match and you're suddenly not playing tennis, the other person can't uh-huh. keep hitting the ball back. So yes, absolutely. Right. The dynamic shifts because you're not entering into the drama. Does that mean they're changed? I don't know. Does that mean they're showing up differently with you? Probably, which is great. Yeah. Yay. Um, yeah. And, and I think that's more, that's more, I don't think that they have necessarily changed, right. but when they're with you, it is, it is different, which is your ultimate goal, I guess, anyway. Yeah. And I think it's what it does is it shifts your feeling within the situation. So ultimately whatever they do becomes unimportant, whether they don't change and they're consistent, whether they change in respect to the dynamic of the the back and forth of the relationship, because you're not playing ball. All of it is, um, it's sort of immaterial. And then there will be the people who don't change. There will be the people who can't keep up. There will be the people who liked you when you were being consistent with them so they liked to know that you were that person they liked to look at you that way and so those people tend to naturally just not know how to handle the new you and you will find that your life self-edits around the whole kind of people self-edit themselves out of your life yes can't deal with it like they literally just don't know how to handle the non-drama because so many people get something from the challenges. And it's not a sexy thing to say. It's not, you know, the right thing to admit sometimes, but people can be addicted to drama. They can, because it's, 
you know, we talk about nervous system safety all the time. But the thing that I want to make the point really clear on, and I wish I should do a better job of doing this more often, is that safety is programmed into you. So it's not safety is one thing and unsafety is another thing. You learn what's safe in your early years. And so if what is safe is drama and challenge and, you know, adrenaline, you learn that that's normal. So when you feel that in life, you feel that this is a a safe place. It's your happy place. It's familiar. So familiarity is often the safest thing to the nervous system, not true. I am a safe vehicle right now. So if you, Mm -hmm. you, we've got tons of people wandering around completely addicted to drama. So if you suddenly don't play the drama game and you don't enter into their kind of tit for tat dynamic and you don't have the same reaction to someone they might feel lost and not like, and like they can't, that you're not their friend anymore because they can't have an argument with you, which sounds weird, but they will just leave. They will just not stay. You know, and I'm, I really don't do um, like bitching and gossiping. We're very similar like that. We just don't like it. We just, it's just not like, it just doesn't, why would I waste my time talking about other people? Um, But some people I've lost friends because I just wouldn't have the conversation because like, I don't see things in that way. I had a whole conversation mm. with my mum today about um, sort of conspiracy theories. And she was just relaying some to me. She's not a weird conspiracy theorist, just to be clear, but she was just relaying some and relaying something that Russell Brand was talking about on his podcast. And I was just listening and was like, why are people so quick to attribute negative meaning and malice to all of these people? You know, it's just, it, I just don't see the world in the way that people do, but you find that your circle edits itself based on how you show up. So do others change just because you do? Well, if they don't, they probably won't stay around for very long. Mm. Yes. And I kind of want to really make sure that we have been incredibly clear. And I think we have, because I think that it's been incredibly clear in the way we've kind of explained it. But what we're talking about here is taking responsibility for the change. Not you have to change and then everyone else will. Not you have to love yourself in order to get other people to love you. But you have to take radical responsibility for what's happening inside you. And that includes if you're putting up with somebody who won't change. It includes if you're always being triggered into the same response pattern and actually making the whole situation worse. And none of this is about blame or guilt. You don't get to feel bad about this. You just get to own the responsibility. And it's if you're wanting something to change and you're really wanting some kind of situation to change and you've checked yourself and you know what it's about for you, then you have absolutely all of the power and the responsibility, the ownership, whatever else you want to say to make that change happen or to get what you need, basically. Um, But none of that comes from blame or guilt or you did it wrong or that other person should be, it's just, it's not, just not valuable to see it like that. Absolutely. I agree. So I think when we look at the title of can they ever really change? I think the resounding answer is yes. <laughs> because in partnerships and relationships, you get to have that conversation. In family, you get to do your work. So you either don't need the change or you diffuse the situation by not playing the, the tit for tat. So change is totally possible, but it isn't always just proactive motivational habit forming change because that's not real change anyway you don't want somebody to change just because they've made a new habit you want them to change because it's in innate and organic for them to behave in the new way and that goes for us too that goes for you too when you're doing the whole kind of acceptance thing it's about making it really a natural flow from you to you know just be different yeah not something occurred to me and I may just be repeating what you, you said, but you're like, is change possible? Yes, but it's from your perspective. It's always from your perspective because you are seeing things through a lens or not. So the way that you see them is going to change the way that you see them, the way you react with someone else is going to change. 
So I think if you're doing your inner work, it's inevitable that others around you will change if only by how you are receiving them Mm -hmm. to go back to receive. Hmm. Yeah. It's, um, I love, I love what you just said. It's like, if you're doing your inner work, change is inevitable because that's what you're doing it for. Right. And we, we've literally just sat with each other and planned out our editorial calendar for the year. And, you know, we've got some interesting podcast topics coming up, but like a lot of it is be in some kind of personal development and personal growth work and be always on attending to your own garden because you're the soil in which everything is planted. So that's right. If you're unhappy with your crop or your yield or how pretty your flowers are, change the soil because you're the soil in which everything is planted. Oof, love that. That's yeah, so lovely. I that up. I, I, I just made that up. And the worst thing is, Brace, you know I kill plants. You know I'm terrible at keeping them alive. Like, honestly, my first Airbnb hostess in L.A. literally had to take the orchids out of my house in Brace's presence and went, that's dead. And I was like, oh, I was trying. I was really trying. So, yes, I can't keep I can't keep flowers alive, but one's own soil, one waters and nurtures and fertilizes and all that jazz. <laughs> yes. Yes. Beautiful. Well, I am. Um, I feel that we've covered quite a lot today I, I and like all of our podcasts we went so much more and so much deeper into the subject matter which i absolutely love because we always start these conversations and then ideas come in how are you how are you feeling good feeling yeah. good yeah absolutely well everyone we hope that this has given you some insight into yourself into others into your life the whole nine um and again if something is unclear, you still feel not quite complete with, you know, anything that we've discussed today, reach out to us, like, let us know. We are here to only help and guide. So yeah. do all the things. Do all the things. Email us podcast at unveil enterprises.com. If you want to come to our loving yourself or more specifically, and I don't know that we've given the title yet, but the title is Redefining the Route to Loving Yourself. In typical Unveil fashion, we are completely disrupting and upending like we did today. Like it's very much going to be going to feel like today. It's like that thing that you think is true. Well, is it really true? And where does it come from if it is true? Lots of that during that workshop. 11th and 12th of June, go to unveilenterprises.com forward slash workshop. Um, and yeah, um, there was something else that I was going to say, but I've totally forgotten. So we'll call that a day. I love it. Brilliant. Love this conversation. So good. So good. But for now, my name is Brace Harris. My name is Victoria Fenton. And we are Unveil. Stay informed with all things Unveil. Sign up for the newsletter at unveilenterprises.com forward slash sign up. Sign up.